So in case you're curious what everybody else yeah. wrote about, the allure of invincibility and how it impacts knighthood in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, a knight's gentleness of re or full, that is true or false, perfection and honor, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, a lady and her knight, a woman's power playing courtly love, the visibility of sin in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, a knight in shining armor, Trying to see if I had the um, paper topics with me, and I don't. Because uh, they all sound like they're on the same thing. A knight in shining armor, the symbolism of the pentangle, and the green girdle. Let's see, that's four, two, four, three, four, one. Okay, so there. Uh, knighthood do's and don'ts. The woes of medieval wooing. Treatment of courtly love in Lawnball and Surround of the Green Knight. Yours and mix it in so nobody knows who it is. Uh, what not to do when being seduced. <laughs> and less than kind, quotation marks, expressions and maltreatments of gentilessa in Lawnball and the wife of Bath's tail. The ideal knight according to Lawnball, Sir Gowan, and the wife of Bath's tail. The girl. <laughs> The girdle fitting your form for him. I like that title. Uh, knighthood in Middle English literature, perpetual imperfection. Good. The ideal medieval knight, accountable and true. No good sir is perfect. <laughs> That's good. Um, love or temptation, how courtly love can affect a knight's royal duties. And a knight of quality represented through Lonval, Sir Gowan of the Green Knight, and the Canterbury Tales of General Prologue, and the Wife of Bath Prologue, and Tale. Okay. Ben Johnson. So we did, you know, uh, half, we did more than a half dozen. I guess we did a total of maybe about ten of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, I know at least one of you said you want to write about the sonnets. Can't remember who that was off the top of my head, but I would strongly encourage you, if you're going to write your term paper on it, which you do a week from today, and if you haven't thought about a topic, you're late. <laughs> uh, just throw that out there. Um, you really ought to read all of them. Just read all 154 right through. It won't take you that long, uh, but at least get them all in your mind so that you're familiar with them, okay? But today we start Johnson, start and finish Johnson, um, contemporary of Shakespeare's, competitor of Shakespeare's. Well, competitor of late Shakespeare, at least, more so than early 1590s and stuff. Johnson pretty much dabbled in all the poetic forms. Your introduction goes into that. I'm not going to um, address the introduction really at all, or talk about Johnson's background or biography. I just want to, because uh, we're running out of time, jump into the poem. So you've got a pretty good variety of the kind of stuff Johnson wrote. And I do want to mention this, however. Johnson is really the first poet in England to consider what he did as work. That is, being a poet was work. How do we know? Because in 1616, the year Shakespeare died, Johnson published his works, a book titled The Works of Benjamin Johnson. And it has, and I, I thought there was a picture of it in your book, but it's not. I'll, um, I'll try to put an image of the title page or the cover page on, uh, on D2L. It's got this, this you know, um, engraving as the cover. And it's this massive edifice, like this big, <coughs> massive building. And works in bold caps. You know. And he, he is saying there, this is work like building a cathedral is work. Okay, He was the son of a bricklayer, so he knew about building a cathedral. Um, his father provided well for him. He was able to go, out, go to the Westminster School in London, which was kind of the premier, we would call it like a prep school, uh, 
boarding school. That's where he got the basics of Greek and Latin, as Shakespeare did at the King Edward VI school. But then he also went on to university, etc. Okay, Johnson was a, uh, for his day, a well-known scholar of languages, Greek and Latin. Okay, so. I know it's not on the syllabus, but let's start, as we ought to start, with what he says to the reader. Most books printed in the Renaissance, many books printed in the Renaissance, begin with a thing like, um, like Shakespeare's sonnets do, or the first folio does, an epistle dedicatory, a dedicatory letter, okay? It'll have that, and then sometimes there will also be a poem variously linked to the reader, Johnson's. To the reader, pray thee take care that takes my book in hand to read it well, that is, to understand. So, Johnson's telling his reader, if you're going to read this, pay attention. Work at it. I worked at writing it. You work at understanding it. Okay? Now, skip from all of that and go to the first one that I had on the syllabus. On my first daughter. Okay, we get on my first daughter, skip the one to jump, done for a moment, and then on my first son. Both of these poems are what kinds of poems? Very essentially, epitaphs. Both children died young. Okay? Eldest son, eldest daughter, both died in youth. On my first daughter. Here lies to each your parents, Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet, all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to Ruth. Okay? Because he needs Ru, he needs a word to rhyme with do, so he uses Ru. We don't use Ru very much anymore, other than in the phrase, Ru the day, you know, which is Shakespeare, if I remember correctly. At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. She died at six months old. With safety of her innocence, however, is kind of interesting. Because being a good Catholic, as Johnson was, he would know children are not born innocent. Okay? One of the reasons for the Catholic practice of infant baptism, meaning real soon after birth, is so that if the child dies in youth, the child will go straight to heaven. No purgatory. Straight to heaven. If the child is not baptized, however, goes to hell. And it's not hell for a while. It's hell permanent. Okay? It's not, you know, Dante's lowest version of hell, however. It's kind of the limbo idea, state of hell. But... She died with safety of her innocence. Why? Probably because of being baptized. And I think there's also because there is, even in the Catholic Church in, in Johnson's day, this idea about an age of innocence. That is, a child doesn't become accountable for his or her actions until, essentially, the age of confirmation. Okay? When they are confirmed into the Catholic Church, um, they know what it is they need to know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? So, whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears, named after Mary, in comfort of her mother's tears, has placed amongst her virgin train, where while that severed doth remain. Her soul, Johnson's writing, is placed among her... I'm so tired. Not Harry's train, Mary's train in heaven. And my next class, Harry Potter, though we're no longer on Harry Potter, we're doing Lord of the Rings. Mary's train, Mary's followers. Why is little Mary placed among great Mary's train? She's the okay, she's the mother. We're given an idea. How is train described? What's the modifier? Virgin. Okay, little Mary died a virgin. Well, one would hope so, because if not, something in America, you know, you no longer know it. Um, because she died virginal as Mary did, okay? Where while that severed, death remained. What severed? Soul, body. Notice how it begins. 
Here lies. Now, I said it's an epitaph. This could easily be put on a tombstone. Right? Where while that severed death remained, this grave partakes the fleshly birth. Why? Heaven takes the spiritual birth, which cover lightly gentle earth. In other words, don't pack it all down. Don't squish it. In other words, all right? 1616. Why? Because that's when the poem is published. It's published in the works, right? Um, in one of my books, and I don't have it written down in this one, I'm trying to remember. We know she died when she was six months, but I don't know what year that was. I'm, and I'm completely drawing a blank. Okay, um, skip the one to done for a minute. We'll do that after the two epitaphs. Look at On My First Son. So, eldest daughter dies at six months old. On my first son. Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, love, boy. Child of my right hand. We've got a gloss, but that's Johnson signaling to us the name of the child. It's Benjamin. The name Benjamin means son of the right hand, son of my right hand. Hand, right? My sin was too much hope of the loved boy. How can you have too much hope of a child? And notice Johnson says it was my sin. Is he suggesting the child died because of his sin? Well, the Old Testament sins of the fathers are visited upon the children even unto the fourth generation. Could be. Hold that idea uh, for a moment. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate on the just day. There's an idea from Old English poetry, right? Loaned. You were loaned to me. This lana leaf, okay? You were loaned to me, and I... What do you have to do with every loan? Pay it back. So he says, so I paid you back. How? Exacted by thy fate on the just day. What's the just day? That's the date on the promissory note. The only difference here is when the little boy was born, God didn't deliver a note you know, from heaven and said... Oh, by the way, he's going to die on. <clears throat> oh, could I lose all father now? It's an exclamation. It's not a question. Is he saying, I wish I'd never been a father? That's how it is sometimes read. Now, I've got four kids. None of them, thankfully, have died. But I've known people who have had children who died. And sometimes they say, wish they had never been born. Why? Because the pain of losing that child was so great. Wish could I have never been father. Could I lose all father? For why will man lament the state he should envy? Well, what's the state? And notice, man here, I think, is gender specific. He's talking about men. Why should men Lament the state, fatherhood, he should envy. Well, if you were a father and the child is dead, are you still a father? Are you still a mother if your child is dead? You mothered that child, you fathered, but fathering and mothering is what? It's an ongoing process. You know? <laughs> And for some of us, it doesn't end. I mean, your parent might be 70, 80 years old, and they're still, I'm going to tell you what to do. You know? For me now, it's almost just the opposite. I'm trying to tell my 83-year-old father, you know, what he should and should not be. So. <laughs> There's the, you know, child becomes the father of the man kind of a thing all over again. So, why will a man lament the state he should envy? What's the other state 
he should envy. And this, in this question, the man is generic. It's not gender specific. How, why should one lament the state? Well, what's the state? Where's little Benjamin? Dead. Why should we lament death? What does death bring to us? Louder? Sadness. Sadness? Grief. Grief? Why? Who's the us that death brings those things to? The living. Those left behind. Okay. What about those who die? Well, you have to put yourself, I think, in Johnson's faith tradition for a moment. Catholic Church, or even broader, Christianity. What happens when you die? One of two places. You do it right, heaven. You do it wrong, hell. Why, he's asking, should we lament the state of death? I mean, Socrates says, don't worry about death. Why? It's a great unknown. Dumbledore says, it's the next great adventure for the well-trained mind, for the well-prepared mind. Johnson goes on. And I think the next line helps us understand what specifically he wants us to understand by the state that we should envy, or that he should envy, question mark. To have so soon scaped worlds and flesh's rage, and if no other misery, yet age. And what does that take us back to? That takes us back to Hrothgar's speech, where he tells Beowulf, Beware of pride. Why? Because what's going to happen? Sword, spear, illness, or old age. <clears throat> You're going to die, Beowulf. Okay? To have so soon escaped worlds and flesh's rage. World, that is, the world writ large. Flesh, my own flesh. And he's probably talking Pauline language here, you know. I do what I don't want to do. I don't do what I ought to do, kind of a thing. And if no other misery, that is, and if you don't have any problems with your own flesh, and you don't have any problems with the world, okay, one, there's something wrong with you, but we'll leave that alone for How about age? Now, I think Johnson's poem here He might have kind of a more specific audience than just a general one. <clears throat> because it's hard to get, I'm not casting aspersions on any individual, but it's hard to get 20-somethings primarily to think about age. I had a student in my office yesterday morning thinking about, asking about, you know, changing from an advertising major to an English major told me what she wants to do in life. I said, yeah, you want to leave advertising and become an English major. And she started to say something. She goes, oh, I just forgot it. And I said, get used to it. It comes with age. She goes, yeah, but I'm too young for Alzheimer's. Yeah, 2022, you're too young. But you're never too young to start thinking about it. Okay. Why? Because every day, time passes by. The whole point of a carpe diem poem, of which this is not, is what? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Why? Because nobody, here's where I get morbid, nobody in this room knows that you're going to have tomorrow. You think you do. Why? Because you're here today. And that means you were here yesterday. But tell that to those 17 Parkland students and teachers. Tell that to the 32 students who went to Virginia Tech one morning in 2007 and didn't come home. Tell that to the over 3,000 people who went, you know, to the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001 and didn't go home. Okay? <clears throat> if no other misery yet, age. I think he's talking about age from the perspective of someone who's old. Now, I'm 56. That's, you know, I used to think, man, that's old. Usually when I wake up, I think, man, that's old. It's not as old as 
86 or 66. But it's also not the same as 46 or 36 or 26. Rest in soft peace. I think he's saying, you know, little Benjamin, in one sense, you're lucky. You're lucky. Rest in soft peace. And ask, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. What does he mean, his best piece of poetry? What is a poem? Literally. Go back to the ancient Greek. Poesis. If I spell it right. Poesis is making. It's what it means. A poet is a maker and a poem is merely something made. We, however, attribute certain conventions to the word poem. It is something made what? Of words. Of words. Okay. Rest in soft peace and ask, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson his best piece of poetry. Here's the best thing I ever made. As well as maybe the poem on a tombstone. Okay. For whose sake, henceforth, all his vows be such. For whose sake? For Ben Johnson's sake? Or for little Benjamin Johnson's sake? All his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. As what he loves may never like too much. Why? Well, what does it mean, first of all? Can you love something too much? I'm saying this and this. How can you love something too much? Let me rephrase that. How can you love a person too much? Louder? Put them on a pedestal. Bingo. You put that person before, within a Christian framework, before God. Okay? I don't think it's in here. Oh, and I didn't, I've got to remember to do that. Um, just real briefly. Why do you not include that one? Because nobody ever includes um, John Donne, in his Holy Sonnets, they don't include number 17. Um, John Donne wrote a series of Holy Sonnets. Not Den and not Senate. Fat fingers. D O N N E. Sonnet 17. Just want the poem, not the analysis. I don't want the analysis. The poem. John Dunn wrote a series of holy signs. So I did my dissertation on these, I edited them. Um, and one of the sonnets named, just titled, Sonnet 17, he wrote after the death of his wife. We'll talk about done tomorrow or Tuesday, right? In Sonnet 17 reads, Since she whom I loved hath paid her last death to nature and to hers, and my good is dead, and her soul early into heaven ravished, Holy on heavenly things my mind is set. Now that she's dead, I'm going to focus on heavenly things. Okay? I need to send this to my dad. <laughs> Here, he's been dealing with my mom's death from two years ago. 
Here, the admiring her, my mind did wet to seek the God. Okay? My admiring her wet sharpened. That's what the word wet means. It doesn't mean, you know, poured water on it. Okay? It sharpened my mind to seek you, God. So streams do show the head. Streams, water, rivers, show the head, the source of the stream. She was for him the stream. He followed the stream back. She led him to God. But though I have found thee, and thou my thirst hast fed, a holy thirsty dropsy melts me yet. That is, it's like I've got the plague. But why should I beg more love, when as thou dost woo my soul, thou, God, dost woo my soul, for hers offering all thine. For hers, instead of hers, in place of hers, offering all thine. Well, what's the all thine? It's Christ hanging on the cross. Okay? And does not only fear, lest I allow my love to saints and angels, things divine, but in thy tender jealousy dost doubt, lest the world flesh, yea, devil, put thee out. That final couplet, he's saying that God is jealous because God is a little bit doubtful. <laughs> Why? Because maybe the world, and this is a very Pauline idea again from the New Testament, the world, the flesh, the devil. Will do what? Squeeze God out of Dunn's soul. Okay? As what he loves may never like too much. Dunn, in his last three sonnets, 17, 18, 19, is dealing with this idea that it's possible to love a person too much. And what, what do you do? You put that person, put that person before God. So rather than that person drawing you to God, that person becomes your total focus. Okay? He's saying, don't let that happen to me. Don't let it happen to me. Okay? Don't let me become so focused on this. Well, there's another reading too, which is what? The other reading is a very caustic reading, a very skeptical reading, a very human reading, in a sense. What does it sometimes feel like or seem like in the human experience or the human condition when you enjoy something too much? What often happens, what sometimes happens? That thing gets taken away from. You need a classic example of this. Read C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces, okay? which is, I would argue, I have argued this in multiple places, the greatest thing he ever wrote. It kind of sums up everything C.S. Lewis wrote, except for one little book that he wrote three years before he died, after his wife died, called A Grief Observed. And a Grief Observed is exactly what it sounds like. A grief observed. He takes his grief over his wife's death and kind of observes it from a clinical perspective. But the clinician at the beginning isn't the distant objective narrator. The clinician, the observer, is the lover of the one who is taken away. And he essentially says in that it's a little short book. He writes it, publishes it under a pseudonym. Why? Because the pseudonym is not C.S. Lewis, author of The Problem of Pain. Why, why does pain exist? How can there be pain if God is good, in, in other words? Okay? It's not C.S. Lewis, author of Mere Christianity. In other words, you got problems? I've got all the answers for you. I've got all the rational arguments for you. No. Because the author of A Grief Observed is someone who's going, damn you, God. Why? Because you brought this person into my life when I was a happy, confirmed, old, stodgy, boring, 
British Don Bachelor. And you bring this quote-unquote atheist divorcee Jew into my life, and she turns me head over heels in love. She becomes a Christian. They get married. Why do they get married? She gets cancer. Okay? And they have two ceremonies. One, civil ceremony. That's to make it so she can stay in England. Then they have a religious ceremony. Why? Because now he means it. She gets the cancer. They get married. Cancer goes in remission. Think that. Three years. They go to Greece, do stuff they all eat while it's And then she dies. And then he, you know, okay, mere Christianity. And he just blasts God. Why? Exact same stuff Johnson's talking about here. As to love as what he loves may never like too much. What Lewis gets to at the end of the grief observed, you don't put all your happiness here. Where else have we seen that? Uh, wanderer, <laughs> seafarer, Beowulf, bead to an extent. What does the old pagan guy tell King Edwin? You know, if our religion were the truth, I should be rolling in dough, man. <laughs> and I get screwed day in, day out. It doesn't work. It's, it's in almost everything we've read so far. Okay? Okay, now look at ben, uh, ben Johnson. Now look at, to John Dunn. I said Johnson and Shakespeare were competitors. Well, in plays they were. Johnson and Dunn were competitors in poetry. Okay? They were also good friends. Johnson writes, I think, three poems to Dunn. And then in the mid-16-teens, I think that's about right, maybe a little bit earlier, 1611 or so, Johnson has a conversation or a series of conversations with a Scottish poet named William Drummond. These get published in a little book called Conversations with William Drummond. Real original title there. Um, with Johnson. Okay? And in those conversations, John, Johnson, Johnson, Dunn and Johnson together, Johnson makes two comments about Dunn and his poetry. He says, one, Dunn, for not keeping of accent, deserved hanging. Accent, like iambic pentameter, having the right stress, all the right syllables. Okay, so... For not keeping accent, he deserved hanging. And the other one was... Had something to do with syntax. Something to do with syntax, and he said that Dunn would not be read outside, essentially, his lifetime or shortly thereafter. That nobody would read Dunn because it was too hard. Okay? Interestingly... Dunn's works, his first collected edition of his poetry, published in 1633, two years after his death. There are six other editions within about 40 years after that, okay, of just his poetry. Dunn is also a preacher. His sermons get published wildly throughout the 17th century. More people read Dunn today than they read Johnson. For a variety of reasons. One, Dunn's a dirty poet. Okay. I mean, they just like the dirty ideas in some of Dunn's poets. But he's a more difficult poet. I mean, he's grappling together uh, ideas. And in the 18th century, Dunn's poetry wasn't really almost read at all. People read, read Dunn for his sermons. Imagine that. <laughs> Long, intricately detailed sermons. Okay, Because his sermons could last up to three hours. The sermon would be three hours. That's not including all the other parts of the service, the hymns, etc., reading of scripture. So, to John Dunn. Dunn, the delight of Phoebus and each muse. Now, you could just stop right there. Who's Phoebus? God of poetry. The delight of Phoebus. That means... Phoebus has looked down at John Dunn and go, you know, I kind of like you. I'm going to 
give you everything. So that's one. And each muse. Well, there are nine muses. Epic poetry, lyric poetry, narrative poetry. He's saying, not fair. All the muses of literature poured all their influence in John Donne. Who, to thy one, all others' brains refuse. Well, who do you think Ben Johnson means with all others? Yeah, not fair. Because I work. I really work at writing poetry. That's why I titled it, Works. <laughs> Whose every work of thy most early wit came forth example and remain so yet. Okay? Remain so yet. Whose early work? Now, this gets published in 1616. Dunn still has a bunch of poetry to write. Uh, pretty much most of his religious verse, okay, except for the Holy Sonnets, um, all of his Almost all of his, um, what are called episodes and obsequies, these are verses about people's deaths, etc. But all of his secular verse is done. He's, pun intended, he, he's finished writing all of that. Right? And that's the kind of stuff Johnson's probably talking about there. Longer unknowing than most wits do live, in which no affection praise enough can give. To it, thy language... Letters, arts, best life, which might with half mankind maintain a strife. That is, Dunn's language, his use of language and knowledge of languages. Okay? His letters. He means both his literal letters. Dunn was a voluminous letter writer. We have many copies of letters. He wrote letters <coughs> in verse form. Okay? We have one letter that survives in Dunn's own handwriting. Um, art, best life, etc. He says, Dunn could take on half of humanity on his own. He, he, he's giving Dunn a lot of credit there. Okay? All which I meant to praise. What is the all which? Everything that comes before. All that's mean to praise you, Dunn. And yet I would. I would, I wished, I desired. But I stopped. Why? Because I can't, as I should. You're beyond praise, Dunn is saying. I'm assuming Johnson is saying to Dunn. Does that mean Dunn won the competition? Eh. I would argue, be interesting to have Dr. Donovan, Kevin Donovan come in, because his dissertation was on John Dunn. <laughs> Have him come in and we'd have it, he'd win because he's a better arguer than I am. But I'd say Dunn's a better poet than he is. He, Johnson, not Don. <laughs> Dunn's a better poet than most everybody. So, Okay, so go from there to da, 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 Shakespeare, 907. Now, my previous class, I brought in the facsimile copy of the first folio of Shakespeare. To show that the play we were doing today in the first folio has no line, has no act or scene divisions. It's the only play of all of Shakespeare's that has no act or scene division. It's kind of strange that way. Editor kind of thinks this is Shakespeare going to hell with convention. I'm Shakespeare. I'm at the height of my power. I'm just going to, you know, let it free flow kind of a thing. Possibly. But in the first folio, this is one of several poems that are prefaced at the beginning, okay? It's, it's a commendatory verse. In the Renaissance, it was regularly, it was a regular occurrence. When a poet died, for the poet's friends to write a poem celebrating that person's life and or poetry, etc., and then gather it all together and publish it in a little book, okay? It, it didn't have to be a major poet that this happened for. There's a guy named um, Edmund Carey, Edward Carey, I can't remember the first name. 
a relatively minor poet. Last name is C-A-R-E-W, but it's pronounced Carey. Relatively minor poet. He died crossing the Irish Sea in a ferry accident. Okay? He had written, I don't know, a couple dozen poems, 30 or 40 poems. Real minor. I mean, you only read them in, when you're a graduate course in 16th century non or 17th century non dramatic poetry of minor poets, kind of a thing. Good person to write a dissertation on, because maybe three have. <laughs> well, he died, and so a bunch of his friends gathered together poems about his death. One of those people who wrote a poem about him was the young John Milton, because Milton was his friend. All right. Shakespeare died in 1616. There's no book of commendatory verse on Shakespeare's death. There are apparently no individual manuscript copies of poems about Shakespeare's death in manuscripts from roughly 1616 to 1623. Okay. I, when I was working on the Dunvery Orm, which my, my work on that came out of um, my dissertation, because I was working for the general editor of the Dunbury Orm, I, I had access to literally hundreds of manuscripts of the late 16th and early 17th century. You know, that I would, for my work on the Very Orm, I'd scroll through, this is on microfiche, I'd scroll through, you know, find poems, transcribe them, so that we would have copies of all these. And every now and then I'd find something, like I found a couple of snippets of, of Dun poems that nobody else had ever found before. Why? Because nobody had looked through all. The, there's thousands of manuscripts that people have never, in the last 300 years, opened. It's just, you know, somebody has gone and said, okay, here's a poem on, here's a poem on, here's a poem on, and so it gets described as uh, commonplace poetry, early 17th century. That's it. It might have first lines of all the poems, but they don't really know what they say. Okay. Anyways, apparently, in all these manuscripts that survive, there are no poems celebrating Shakespeare's death. Well, that is one of the so-called proofs for the anti that's an R for the anti Stratfordians. The people who say the William Shakespeare of Stratford upon Avon, born in 1564, was not the same William Shakespeare who wrote the plays. Somebody else did. Why? Because if that guy was the one who wrote the plays, then when he died in 1616, people would have written commendatory verse about, I'm kidding, this was Shakespeare, obviously. Now, we do know that there was a Shakespeare in the Lord Chamberlain's men, who then became the same Shakespeare in the King's Men, that is, the acting group that was supported by the king after King James became king. Okay? Lord Chamberlain's men, kind of the right-hand man to Queen Elizabeth, so supported by essentially Queen Elizabeth, that that was the William Shakespeare of Stratford on Avon. We know that was the same person. What the anti Stratfordian says. Yeah, but that wasn't the person who wrote the plays. And they essentially have one reason for saying that. He didn't attend university. You want to talk elitist? <laughs> and elitism? That country bumpkin could not have written these plays. Because what is Stratford upon Avon to London in the United States to Washington, D.C.? I keep using this example. I'm sorry if you're from there. It's Woodbury. <laughs> it's no place compared to London. Okay. How could a hick from Woodbury write these plays without a university education? Couldn't be. Had to be a member of the nobility or the upper class at least had to be what's called a university wit, somebody who had attended university, like Ben Johnson, like John Donne. 
even though Dunn never got a degree. Okay? Not that Ben Johnson and Dunn are suggested as Shakespeare. They're not. Usually it's Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, or a couple of other, Francis Bacon, etc. Well, you can imagine who are the supporters of Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, who are the supporters of Francis Bacon? Descendants of Edward de Vere and descendants of Francis Bacon, essentially. Okay? So, Johnson writes this. It gets affixed to the beginning of the first folio. Johnson knew Shakespeare. There is no way Johnson could not have known Shakespeare living in London at the time, writing plays at the time. So he begins. To the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. Let me, one more comment. The first folio is put together by Shakespeare's fellow actors. Okay. From the same company that he was part of. Good friends of his. They put it together seven years after he dies. We don't know why they wait so long. It's possibly, it's possible they couldn't get access to some of the plays. See, some of the plays had already been published in quarto form. That means the publishers essentially had what we think of today as copyright. They had to wait till those rights died or essentially dissolved before they could get copies of the play to produce. Not before they could get copies in their hands, but before they could have the right to publish them. Okay, So that it could be that. We don't know exactly. So to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. Now, the long poem opens, and Johnson says one thing, and then he's going to kind of backtrack. So everything from to draw no envy to the end of line 16 can kind of be read as prologue. And essentially what, Don, what Johnson does with all that is, never mind, and therefore I will begin, line 17, or I therefore will begin. But let's go back to the beginning. To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book, that is, the first folio, and fame. People still talk about you. People still talk about your plays. His plays are still being produced. In London. While I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much. Neither man, those of us down here, we lowly human beings, nor even the muses can praise your writings too much, Shakespeare. Tis true, and all men's suffrage. Suffrage. What does that mean? What, is, what was the suffragette movement? That, that ending tells you. Uh, women, getting the right to women getting the right to vote. Suffrage is voting. It, and all men would vote the same, he says. Okay. But these ways were not the paths I meant under thy praise. In other words, scratch that. <coughs> Bad beginning. Let's see. How do I start? For silliest ignorance on these may light. Silliest. Foolish. Even the stupid person could say what I just said. But I'm not a stupid person because I'm Ben Johnson. I wrote the works of Benjamin Johnson. So i got to go somewhere else. Which, when it sounds at best, but echoes right. It echoes. Why? What does he mean, again, by silliest ignorance on these may light? At some point in your life, your English majors, you'll probably take a Shakespeare course before you graduate if you haven't already or aren't already. Poor few who have me. And so you're going to read a bunch of Shakespeare. And you might even have an opportunity to go to London and see a bunch of Shakespeare plays in London, etc. And you might become a great aficionado of Shakespeare. You might just learn to love Shakespeare. And maybe you go on to graduate school, become a PhD, and you're going to you know, go to parties or whatever. You'll be a graduate student. And you'll be at some mixer, some kind of mixer, and you'll be talking about Shakespeare. Somebody go, oh, I just love Shakespeare. And after a two seconds conversation, you find out they know squat. 
They've never read Shakespeare. They've never heard Shakespeare. They've never seen Shakespeare. But they love Shakespeare. That's the silliest ignorance. The best they can do is but echo. Repeat what they've heard. Or blind affection, which doth ne'er advance the truth, but gropes and urges all by chance. Well, that's more of the same. Or crafty malice, that is, someone might praise you, but really meaning to undercut you. Might pretend this praise and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. These are as some infamous bod or whore. Bod. A madam. Right? The whore is the one that the madam procures for somebody. Okay? These are as some infamous bod or whore should praise a matron. A matron. A fine, upstanding, older, married woman. Ladies, imagine, I'm going to, this isn't casting aspersions, it's the exact opposite. Opposite. Imagine you're in your 40s, you've been married, you have children, you're a fine, upstanding member of the upper crust of society. Do you really want Kim Kardashian praising you for your fine, upstanding nature. No, or some hooker off the street. No, because that's not, not the source of praise you want. You want the other fine, upstanding, you know, matrons of society praising you. Okay? What could hurt her more? But thou art proof. Who's the thou? Is it Shakespeare, the guy in the grave? Or is it the Shakespeare... Preserved in the book, but thou art proof against them, and indeed above the ill fortune of them or the need. In other words, they can do what they want. I therefore will begin. So, those six, forget all that. Let me get to the real point. Soul of the age. What does he mean? <clears throat> If you watch that background lecture, uh, did I talk about this earlier? I might have actually talked about this earlier. You have the Ptolemaic conception of the universe. What is it? Who can describe it? You have the Ptolemaic. It's opposed to the Copernican. Kind of in between those is another one. The heliocentric, the Ptolemaic conception is you have Earth. Earth is at the center of the universe. <coughs> Surrounding the Earth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spheres, and outside the last sphere is the Empyrean, and this is where God dwells. Okay? So think of the Earth as a ball, and then there's a bigger clear ball around it, a bigger clear ball around that, on out. It's like an onion. The universe has an onion, okay? That's the Ptolemaic, why? It's named after Greek astronomer Ptolemy. In this conception, <clears throat> according to medieval believers, Christians Christianize this because each one of these spheres, they still accept it as real, but each one of these spheres has a ruling intelligence, an angelic being. Why did they do this? Go back and look at Daniel, the book of Daniel. And you see a passage in the book of Daniel where Daniel is told that he can't do what he wants to do. Why? Because there is an angelic being over the realm of Persia that is stopping Michael. Right? So it's not just that there's a ruling intelligence over each of the spheres. Guess what? There's a ruling intelligence over nations, according to this idea. If you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, he plays with this idea in his space trilogy. Earth in the space trilogy is what's called the silent planet. Why? Because our ruling intelligence is not in communication with all the others. Why? 
because he's the prince of the power of the air, Satan. He's defected from the others. Okay? So, Shakespeare, uh, Johnson's using this idea. Shakespeare, here's the age, Shakespeare is the soul of the age. He is the ruling spirit. Or, think of the age as a body. A body without a spirit is what? Food for maggots. <laughs> a body with a spirit is a living, breathing thing. Shakespeare is the thing, he says, that animates our age. <clears throat> now, you can't get higher praise than that. Because he doesn't say, you know, you're part of soul of the age, but I'm part two. Soul of the age. The applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. My Shakespeare, and you know, this is Ben Johnson being Jesus. Rise, you know. Shakespeare come forth. Well, when Johnson's writing this, or publishing this in 1623, what's going on in the London stage? Take one of um, either Dr. Kevin Donovan's, you know, drama excluding Shakespeare, or Dr. McCluskey also teaches it. And by the 1620s, the Elizabethan stage, as Johnson is going to say, kind of starts to droop a little bit. It just doesn't have the liveliness and vitality that it did in the 1590s and very early 1600s. <clears throat> Rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. Where's he talking about? Westminster Abbey. I'm not going to go into Poets Corner and say, Chaucer, budge over there. Need to make room for Shakespeare. <laughs> Beaumont and Fletcher, contemporaries of Shakespeare. In fact, we know Shakespeare helped Beaumont and Fletcher in what? My two, two noble kinsmen? I think that's it. Because we have his handwriting in a manuscript where he touched up a couple of scenes. No, he says, Thou art a monument without a tomb. And art alive still while thy book doth live. Where do you think Johnson gets that idea from? Well, go back for just a second to Sonnet 18. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. As long as people can read Shakespeare... And art alive still while thy book doth live. As long as we don't ban this book, ban it everything else, it's only a matter of time. And we have wits to read and praise to give. Did I not mix thee so, that is, with Chaucer, Spencer, <coughs> Beaumont, Fletcher? Did I not bid, um, or Beaumont, not Fletcher, <coughs> Fletcher's still alive. Did I not mix thee so, my brain excuses. I mean, with great, but disproportion to muses. Chaucer is a great muse. Spencer is a great muse. But they're disproportion. They're out of harmony. He's saying, not everything Chaucer wrote is great. Not everything's the Canterbury Tales. Read the Book of the Duchess. Verbal volume. Good morning, me. What the? How's that for grammar? Okay. For if I thought my judgment were of years, I should commit thee surely with thy peers. Spencer, Beaumont, Lily, Thomas Lily. Okay. Uh, Thomas Lily, John Lily. You got John Lily, you got the footnote down the bottom. Okay. Or Sporting Kid, Thomas Kid, or Marlowe. If you saw Anonymous, it was suggested maybe Marlowe wrote some of Shakespeare's stuff. No, it can't be, because Marlowe was dead before most of it. And though thou had small Latin and less Greek. Ah, the anti stratfordians say, see, see, even Johnson says, Shake, because that gets interpreted sometimes, Shakespeare didn't know Latin or Greek. No, it means, compared to me, the works. <laughs> 
of Ben Johnson. From thence to honor thee, I would not seek for names. Would not seek means from ancient Rome and ancient Greece, I wouldn't have to sit there and go, let's see. Now, who can I compare him to? Drawing a blank. Huh. No. He would do what? Call forth thundering Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles. Well, who are Epidus, Euripides, and Sophocles? Look at your footnote. Stupid footnote. Ancient Greek dramatists, really. <laughs> nope, Sherlock. <laughs> They're not just any, you know, any old Tom, Dick, and Harry ancient. They're the greatest ancient Greek dramatists. Okay? Pacuvius, Achaeus, him of Cordova dead. To life again, you got another footnote. To hear thy buskin tread, boot worn by actors in Greek tragedies. Okay? And a metonym for tragic drama. <coughs> so, to see... To hear thy buskin tread, to hear your tragic boot, to hear your tragedies performed, and shake a stage. Well, like what? What are Shakespeare's greatest tragedies? Hamlet, Hamlet Lear, Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> At least I didn't say Macfellow. <laughs> Macbeth, Othello. Titus Andronicus, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, I even put Titus Andronicus there. Because Titus Andronicus is better than most of the tragedies written during Shakespeare's day. In fact, I would argue Shakespeare's worst tragedy is almost better than the best of the other tragedies. And not just because it's Shakespeare. Even in his really bad stuff, which is not really bad, he's got better characterization than most other playwrights. Or when thy socks were on, your comedies, <coughs> leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth, or since did from their ashes come. Since that did rise from the ashes of ancient Roman Greece. He means Elizabethan tragedies. See, three great periods in the history of drama. The ancient period, Roman Greece, okay? And then dr drama dies out. From roughly about 2300 AD to roughly about 1000 AD. And it begins again in the same place that it originally began religious ceremonies. Drama is reborn in the Middle Ages <coughs> in the Easter service of the church. Why? Passion plays. Bingo. But it's before that. Passion plays develop out. Well, what happens in the Easter service of the church? You have a Portrayal of what? No. Close. Resurrection. Afterward. The <laughs> resurrection. Marys, the Marys, run to the tomb expecting to do what? They're going to anoint the body. And there's an angel sitting there. Dialogue. He's not here. Where is he? He arose. He went before you, as he said he would. That's it. That's the rebirth of drama in the Middle Ages. It's from out of that that you get passion plays, you get the mystery plays, the miracle plays, the morality plays, and everything up to Shakespeare. Drama began back in ancient religious festivals of ancient Greece. Okay? So the Shakespearean period, the Elizabethan period, is the second big great flowering of drama, and the third period is roughly the late 19th century up to today. Well, I'll take that back. I wouldn't say up to today. I'd say any probably in the 60s, like with Tom Stoppard, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern and Dead. I know there's some modern playwrights who are, you know, but not like 50s and 60s with the angry young men and such. So he goes on. Triumph my Britain. Why? <laughs> we outshine them. Well, who's the we? Okay, Shakespeare. <laughs> Triumph, my Britain, thou hast one to show to whom all seas of Europe homage owe. That is, all other playwrights who do essentially scenes of Europe, they must do what? 
Hail Shakespeare, hail Shakespeare. They must pay homage. <coughs> Why? He was not of an age, but for all time. This is why I would argue up on soapbox. It is unconscionable that English majors can graduate with a degree in English literature and not be required to take Shakespeare. I mean, you at least, I think, have got to take one. Probably, I hate to say it, at this point, the majority of English departments in the United States, it's not required. The greatest author in the English language is not required. All right? Just as I would argue, every English major ought to be required to take a course in, and not just because I teach it, but because it's necessary, the history of the English language. Why? So you understand why English is the way it is today. Why that spells fish. Yeah, it's in favor. What the hell is he talking about? Man, what is he smoking? What are the other two? Well, there's all kinds of words. Where, oh, sounds like it. T-I? Phonetically, that could be fish. How do you get enough, though, bow, <coughs> through, and cough? When they all have that same series of letters. How? Largely because of the influence of French in the Middle Ages. French corrupts English. That's why I knock the French a lot when I teach my history of the English language course. But if you don't take that kind of class, you don't understand why modern English spelling makes utterly almost no sense. Or why, you know... You have, no, that's not, <laughs> that word, what's the purpose of the E on the end? What was probably every one of you told in grade school? It makes this, that, right? No, lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> Satan conjured that lie. Okay, this is part of an, of an inflection. Originally, there was something else on the end here, and it wasn't an E. It was, you know, this or this, and it starts to change and then gets dropped off, and this today is like digging up a T-Rex in your backyard. It's a fossil. It is a linguistic fossil, and it tells us an awful lot of information. Right? But if you're Chinese, and you're learning English, you go, you know, because it doesn't make any sense. So, Johnson goes on. He was not of an age before all time, and all the muses, shut up, don't tell me that. Um, and all the muses still were in their prime when, like Apollo, he came forth to warm our ears. Notice, the muses were still in their prime. Okay, the muses are gods. How can gods go old? Uh, well, they have. <laughs> but they were young when Shakespeare was around, he says. Nature herself was proud of his designs. Nature loved to have Shakespeare write about nature. Enjoyed to wear the dressing of his lines, which were so richly spun and woven so fit as since she will vouchsafe no other wit. No other wit. No other intellect who attempts to write plays. Johnson is saying, nature, the goddess nature, <coughs> doesn't smile down upon anybody else like she did on nature, like she did on Shakespeare. In other words, nature, like in Sonnet 20, remember Sonnet 20? What did nature do while she was creating the golden-haired youth who was supposed to be a golden-haired woman? She fell a doting. But she poured everything on Shakespeare. 
the merry Greek, tart Aristophanes, neat Terence, witty Plautus. They don't please us anymore. But antiquated and deserted lie as they were not of nature's family. Yet must I not give nature all. You weren't born totally with disability, Shakespeare. Thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. What does he mean, thy art? Title of his book, The Works of Benjamin Johnson. Art is the work, the craft of writing. How many of you, I shouldn't ask this question. How many of you sat down at a computer and just went, okay, God. First draft, pure genius. I mean, Here's Hamlet. Here's Othello. Here's Midsummer Night's Dream. Here's... Johnson is saying, guess what? Shakespeare didn't do that either. He didn't sit there and just, like Samuel Johnson, we're told, did, write first draft and have somebody banging on the door waiting for it. And Johnson would run the door, open the door, hand the paper out, and the guy would kick the paper and run to the print. Just like that. Okay. He says, no. For though the poet's matter and nature be, that is the stuff the poet writes about, his art doth give the fashion, and that he who cast to write a living line must sweat, such as thine are, thine what? Your lines are living. <clears throat> They're not dead. Must do what? Must sweat and strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil. Okay, now, most people, most scholars, when you get to this point, they're going, yeah, that's Johnson talking about himself there. That's, that's not Johnson talking about William Shakespeare. Some will say, no, that is Johnson telling us he knew personally Shakespeare's writing habits, that it wasn't all just first draft, that Shakespeare really, really had to go through and cross through lines and add things. Or for the laurel, he may gain a score. That is, if you don't do that, what's the laurel? For the A, <laughs> instead of the A, if you don't revise, you may gain a scorn. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> for a good poet's made as well as born. Notice, he doesn't say a good poet isn't born. A good poet is born. A better poet is made. However, how? Work. Work. Struggle. It's like I was telling one of my classes the other day. Writing isn't, for most people, the vast majority, writing isn't fun. Writing isn't easy. I've done ditch digging before as a living. That's not fun either. It's backbreaking. Writing can be mentally backbreaking. If you're doing it right. And such wert thou. What? Born and made a poet. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. Okay, you want to do psychoanalytical reading of Shakespeare? Well, he's not around to talk to. He says, you want to see Shakespeare? Here it is. Look at the sonnets. What does the speaker say to the golden-haired youth? Go! Have children. Why? Preserve your beauty so that people in 20 years can say, when they look at you and you're old and wrinkled and your face is sagging all over, you can say, look, here's my son. See the resemblance? <laughs> and they will see your beauty when they look at that child compared to a portrait of you at 20. Have you ever seen somebody who looks spitting image of his or her parent? I've got a friend, I am not kidding, she could be her grandmother. And her grand, I mean, the picture of her grandmother is like from the 1940s. And Nikki looks exactly like her grandmother, like, do -do 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 -do, like time warp, you know. The father's face lives in his issue, even so the race of Shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines and is well-tuned, well-turned, and true-filed 
filed. What did Shakespeare have to do to get his lines just right? He shaved them a little bit. He's talking the language of craftsmanship. Okay? In each of which he, pun, seems to shake a lance. Some critics read that as saying, see, this is Johnson saying it's not really Shakespeare because he puns on the name as brandished at the eyes of ignorance. Sweet Swan of London? Avon. He links the person being addressed with the person from Stratford-on-Avon. What a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet up here. Come back and make those flights upon the banks of Jim, Tim's that so did take Eliza and our gems, St. Uh, King James. It's a sight rhyme. It's not a verbal oral rhyme. It doesn't really rhyme. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere. Okay, so he's described him as a swan on the water. But now he's up in the air. Why? Because the swan took flight? Yeah, kind of, metaphorically. How so? This is apotheosis. He's just made Shakespeare into a god. advanced and made a constellation there. Well, what is the purpose of stars? Especially in this system. It's where we get modern astrology. If you're born under the influence of a rising or waning star and or planet, etc. Shakespeare will now be the stars shining down on England. Shine forth, thou star of Poets and with rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage. Notice, he's kind of saying, I don't care what you do, but do something. Why? Our plays suck. They're really bad. And in the 1620s, pretty much the Shakespeare kind of plays had been replaced with the Johnson kind of plays that he's writing now. Masks. There's one or two masks in here. Okay. Highly ornate, very ornate costuming, mask, literal masks on the faces. Okay. Not Henry the Fourth, Part One, you know, where you see real people acting with real motivation and such. Chide or cheer the drooping stage, which since thy flight from hence hath mounted like, excuse me, hath mourned like night and despairs day. But for thy volumes light. Why does it mourn? Why does the British, the Elizabethan stage, mourn the daytime? Except for thy volumes light. Well, it's in the daytime when the plays are produced. It's, it's hard to light an Elizabethan stage at night so that people sitting in the back gallery can see everything. Because right? they don't have spots. I mean, all you have are candle lights, torch light. You don't get even torch light on a stage 42 feet across and 25 feet deep. Okay? It despairs, Dave, but for thy volume. Shakespeare, your book is like the light unto our world. <laughs> they despair the stage, except for what? Except for when your plays are being produced. You want to almost guarantee, you want to put on a production and almost guarantee you'll get people to come? Put on a Shakespearean play. If it's summertime, what play do you want to go see? Midsummer Night's Dream, it dead giveaway. And you'll see, I mean, go to London, and you'll see, you know, 15, 20 different productions. Some of them really good, some of them horrible, okay? I mean, I've seen some really, really good ones at the Globe. I've seen horrible ones at the Globe, where everything becomes, you know, a sex joke, when there's no sex joke in the play, okay? And I've seen some 
done by quote unquote amateur groups that are as good as the best of the Shakespeare Globe productions. But that's what he's getting at. Okay, so Johnson gives this kind of praise to Shakespeare. Fair to Midland? No. This is over the top. And if Johnson, if we assume Johnson knew Shakespeare, or put it this way, if we assume Johnson knew who the real author was of the plays attributed to Shakespeare, would he have done this? Because, I mean, this is, <coughs> this is saying, you know, you are everything I really want to be. Johnson's past his prime at this point. I mean, he's, he's, he's losing his creative juices. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. We've got uh, done for whatever data it is, Tuesday.